Welcome back everybody, my name is Nick930, and to celebrate the release of Far Cry 5, we're going to be looking back at the history of the Far Cry franchise. For those of you that don't already know, Far Cry is a first-person shooter game that often drops the player into a large open wilderness area, outnumbered by a large group of enemy combatants, whether they be pirates, mercenaries, or mutant monkeys. Now there's a lot to go through here, so I'm going to try to keep this video as brief as I can without skipping over anything important. So let's start by going way back to 2004 with the original Far Cry. The original Far Cry is the only game in the franchise to have been developed by Crytek Studios. It was designed to show off the new CryEngine software. The CryEngine was initially revealed as a tech demo for NVIDIA, but after the great potential, they ended up turning it into Far Cry. This engine was beyond anything at the time, utilizing 3.0 shaders and even taking advantage of early HDR lighting concepts. Far Cry was a technical marvel with dynamic physics, massive draw distances, beautiful bump mapping textures, and some of the best water simulation ever put into a game at the time. And because of this massive graphical demand, Far Cry initially only released on the PC platform, and it required an insanely powerful computer to run with all the settings cranked up. Far Cry was the crisis of its time, and far exceeded anything else available on the market in terms of graphical fidelity. In terms of story, Far Cry 1 was a very straightforward, cheesy action game. You took the role of Jack Carver, an excessively angry ex-spec op that is shipwrecked in the game's opening cinematic, and trapped on an island filled with ruthless mercenaries. After mowing down countless mercenaries at various locations, Jack finds himself stumbling onto a research facility where scientists are developing strange mutations to local monkeys called Trigens. As you might expect, you end up fighting these mutant monkeys, and as the game progresses, you begin encountering various strains of mutation in human enemies as well. At this point, the game goes from being a semi-realistic stealth action shooter game to a full-on monster shooting gallery, and many players criticize the unnecessary shift. But despite the less than stellar story, Far Cry 1 still has some excellent gameplay on offer. Far Cry, while still a linear shooter game, featured massive open spaces with tons of opportunity for inventive gameplay. It's important to understand what kind of games were available around 2004. Halo 2, Half-Life 2, and Doom 3 all featured relatively small level designs. Far Cry was one of a kind, with seemingly infinite paths to approach objectives from, and long draw distances allowing for very long distance sniping. Another unique feature to Far Cry that very few other games had attempted was stealth action. Far Cry utilized a very rudimentary stealth meter that could be affected by the player's posture, the level of shadow, and even if the player was hiding in dense vegetation. This feature would be essential for slipping past some of the more difficult groups of enemies and gave Far Cry a more sandbox design than other games. Far Cry's physics also played a big role in shaping the gameplay, with various obstacles and traps that could be taken advantage of to cleverly dispatch enemies. Half-Life 2 is known for its physics-based combat, but it certainly wasn't the only game to release that year with a similar approach to its design. But while the graphics, open-ended level design, and creative opportunities for players offered a truly new and fresh experience, Far Cry never seemed to grab its core audience yet, and that's mostly in part to the fact that it released exclusively for PC players. Crytek, the original designers for Far Cry, signed a deal with Ubisoft and gave them the rights to utilize both the Far Cry name and the initial Crytek engine to use in their future games. At this point, Crytek had signed a contract with EA Games to develop another first-person shooter franchise that takes place on a tropical island, and I'm sure you guys can guess which game that was. As for Far Cry, Ubisoft decided to branch out and try and acquire interest in their franchise with the console market, and released Far Cry Instincts in 2005 on the original Xbox. While not as graphically impressive as the original PC game, Far Cry Instincts provided console gamers with familiar gameplay elements that made the original game so unique, from its large open-ended outdoor environments to its combination of stealth and fast-paced shooter action. The game received positive scores, about on par with what the original game received. In 2006, Far Cry Instinct's Evolution released, which was a sequel to Far Cry Instinct. It featured more of the same semi-linear level designs and had a slightly shorter length. The game featured a few new weapons, but little else to mix up the formula. At the same time Evolution released, Ubisoft Montreal also released Far Cry Instinct's Predator, 
which was a sort of remastered collection of both Far Cry Instant games on the Xbox 360. It received slightly lower scores, but still had a generally positive reception. After these console Far Cry games, the franchise stayed pretty quiet, with an arcade game called Far Cry Paradise Lost in 2007. It was clear to Ubisoft that the whole Jungle Island one-man army shtick couldn't support the franchise forever. Far Cry 2 released in 2008, and while it still maintains the basic thematic elements that made the original Far Cry so good, it shares very little else in common with it. In Far Cry 2, you played as one of several preset characters that remained silent throughout the story, as you hunt down an arms dealer named the Jackal in Africa during a civil war. Unlike previous entries, Far Cry 2 featured a large open world, allowing players to truly approach objectives from any angle. Just like the original game, Far Cry 2 pushed the envelope in terms of graphical prowess, with fantastic levels of destruction, especially with its fire propagation mechanics that allowed for very realistic fire effects that could connect to various objects in the game world, and cause things and even enemies to burn. Now, the story was pretty forgettable, with the player working for both sides of a civil war and completing various assassination and intel runs, but the concept of choosing your own weapons and surviving in a brutal open world environment set a new standard for the franchise. Ubisoft Montreal did a fantastic job of introducing some real-world elements to help make the experience more believable. From having to physically get out of your vehicle and fix a damaged engine, to having to clear a gun jam when your weapon is being used too much, Far Cry 2 did its best to keep the player immersed. But while it was a cool concept, the repetitive mission design and needless traveling back and forth made the experience a chore, and having to run back and forth to get malaria pills had players divided, with some loving the realistic design and others finding it tedious. The franchise remained dormant for several years until the massive reveal in 2011 showcased another massive shift for the popular title. Did I ever tell you what the definition of insanity is? Insanity is doing the exact same fucking thing over and over again, expecting shit to change. That is crazy. Far Cry 3 raised the bar again with its graphical design, and featured a return to the franchise's roots, returning to the dense jungle environments and an emphasis on unique combat mechanics, most of which have never been realized in a video game before. The player can now jump down on top of enemies and melee them instantly, sneak up behind an enemy, steal their knife and throw it at another, or blind fire when behind cover. The graphics were perfectly realized with an almost cell-shaded approach to the game's shadows that gave it a very unique aesthetic, and the open world that was previously introduced with Far Cry 2 was greatly enhanced with tons of excellent design choices. Outposts scattered around the world of Far Cry 3 could now be captured by defeating all the enemies on guard, and this allowed players to unlock fast travel points, fixing two of the biggest problems with the last entry. Radio towers were introduced, forcing the player to climb them if they wanted to more easily navigate the area using their map. The weapon system from Far Cry 2 was expanded on as well, with players now able to customize their weapons with various attachments and personalize their experience to suit their style of play. Far Cry 3 had a living, breathing, open world environment, with animals that were more than just decoration. Tigers would hunt deer, and both could be hunted to craft personal upgrades like increased ammo bags, and you could even utilize wildlife to your advantage, luring them to enemy positions and taking advantage of the chaos. And probably one of the most memorable aspects of Far Cry 3 is its significantly more interesting storyline, particularly because of the game's initial antagonist, Voss. Voss is unlike anything I've seen in a video game villain. The voice actor that played Voss absolutely knocked it out of the park, with a villain that feels truly insane and unsettling. Ubisoft loved the performance so much that it became the main advertisement for the game's promotional material, despite not even being the main antagonist in the second half of the game. But while the game's characters were memorable, the actual main story missions were pretty disappointing, with too much of an emphasis on story-related cutscenes and awkward quick-time events. The real value in the Far Cry franchise had begun to shift from its main mission structure to the immersive open-world exploration experience. After the success of Far Cry 3, Ubisoft decided to be a little bit goofy with their standalone expansion, Far Cry 3 Blood Dragon. Blood Dragon featured all of the same mechanics as Far Cry 3, but in a ridiculous 1980s-inspired feature setting, with a ridiculous plot, character dialogue, and giant cyber dragon monsters. It was an immensely fun experience, and is regarded by many as their favorite Far Cry game, despite it only lasting a few hours in comparison to the main entries. Now in 2014, we were given another entry to the main series, Far Cry 4. And unlike other main entries to the series, Far Cry 4 does very little to change the formula at all. 
and felt like, to many, a new setting for Far Cry 3. Now, Far Cry 4 isn't a bad Far Cry game. In fact, it introduces a few really cool mechanics, like the ability to climb on ropes. But trying to follow up the success of Far Cry 3 was always going to be difficult, and while Pagan Min was a fantastic and interesting new antagonist, it still doesn't come even close to the insane energy of Voss. Other returning elements from Far Cry 3 include radio towers to help reveal the map, several enemy outposts to capture to unlock new fast travel points, and an exhaustive amount of side activities. From racing, to intercepting convoys, to hunting rare animals, Far Cry 4's open world is rich and filled with things to do. Another thing that has been improved upon over Far Cry 3 is the game's visuals. Since Far Cry 4 was the first to be released on the newer generation hardware, the game's visual direction went from the semi-realistic, slightly cel-shaded look to being far more realistic, with incredible lighting effects and some of the best vegetation design and shadows I've seen in a first-person shooter game. So while Far Cry 4 didn't actually reinvent the franchise like the other main entries, it did improve on a few elements that helped make it the definitive Far Cry experience so far. And then we have Far Cry Primal, one of my least favorite entries in the franchise. Now, I had to give Ubisoft credit for trying, though. Primal released two years after Far Cry 4 and features one of the most unique locations in gaming, the Mesolithic Age. You'll fight saber-toothed tigers, mammoths, and other tribes with various spears, rocks, and clubs. And while the game seems like a huge reinvention of the franchise, it still somehow feels like a dumbed-down version of Far Cry 4, with the same graphical design, gameplay elements, and an overall similar feel to the game's structure. New to Primal was the ability to tame wildlife, which really didn't require much more than just throwing a hunk of meat at them and petting them. But because of the unrelatable story experience and the awkward melee-focused combat, Primal feels like too big of a departure for the game's roots, and is an experience I never really find myself missing. Far Cry at its roots is a first-person shooter game, where a player is dropped into a large outdoor environment and needs to rely on utilizing the environment to get the upper hand against various hostiles. And I think the announcement of Far Cry 5 returning to the modern setting was the right call by Ubisoft. Far Cry 5 will be releasing tomorrow and will be introducing players to another very unique setting. Instead of dropping the player into a war-torn Africa Sahara or tropical islands, Far Cry 5 has players exploring a lawless Hope County in America, where a radical group of cult members wages war with the local sheriffs. Players will be able to tame animals just like in Far Cry Primal, but Ubisoft has confirmed that things like radio towers will be removed due to popular demand. The game will also feature a few new mechanics like the ability to fly airplanes and a fishing minigame. Make sure you guys stay tuned to my channel as I'll be doing a full playthrough of Far Cry 5 and we'll try to get a review out as soon as I finish the main storyline. In the meantime, I hope you guys like this retrospective look at one of my all-time favorite first-person shooter franchises. Which Far Cry experience was your favorite? Let me know in the comments below and don't forget to like and subscribe for more content posted every week.